fellow Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. We're back! Yeah, we made it. <laughs> making it up there was harder than making it back. Yeah, that was... So, yeah, our little road trip turned into quite the little road trip. Yeah, it was an adventure. <laughs> it turned um, into being stranded on the side of the interstate. <laughs> uh, you gave it away too early. I was going to I was going to tease it with like uh, if uh, we actually used our Instagram, we could have that picture of us in the back of the cop car. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but oh. it, we were just getting a ride. Of course, yeah. uh, like wink wink, you know, like that's what they always say. <laughs> oh, well, I was just getting a ride. Uh, uh, uh-huh. um, but uh yeah, uh that piece of cardboard in the road turned out not to be cardboard. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm driving down the interstate and I I see something fly out of a truck and I hear from the back that looks like cardboard from the be- person riding in the back of the car. Yeah, that was not me, by the way. <laughs> I was I, like, um <laughs> Yeah. And so it wasn't like there was anything I could do anyway. Like, I mean, yeah, probably we, not. we were in heavy traffic. I was in the fast lane, probably doing about 85. Mm-hmm. And we hit whatever that was, which was yeah, definitely some kind of, solid. Yeah, some kind of piece of metal. <laughs> um, and it rolled under the car, rendering it... R- really, it, we the car bounced over it. That's more yeah, accurate, I yeah. think. It, went, it didn't do any damage to the body of the car, but it tore what? the undercarriage up. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were wires hanging out and fluids leaking and yeah it was um and gave the nice. gave the entire car a nice little scare because i immediately like announced to the car that i don't have steering yeah <laughs> because i didn't think i did like because it stiffened up mm-hmm. and i was like oh man like i can't steer the car now um turns out i could and managed to get it off the road yeah but it also turns out that about 40 minutes north of Birmingham in Alabama is no man's land yeah, uh, I was. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of that. Who would have thought? Yeah. So um, there's a lot of Alabama that's no man's land. That's Apparently, true, but, 45 minutes outside of a major city is one of them. Yeah, I. You know, it's like between Birmingham and Huntsville. I wouldn't have thought it was that. I don't know. Empty. I wouldn't have either. But um, but it is. The main takeaway is whether you should buy insurance on your rental car or not. Yeah. And so the answer to that is, as I learned this weekend, is depends on what your deductible is on your car insurance. Yeah. Um, if it's a pretty low deductible, probably shouldn't bother. But if your deductible's high, you should get it. Thankfully, I'm in the low deductible range. Yeah. <laughs> so the most I would have to pay out of pocket would be two hundred and fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. And the insurance was like a hundred and something anyway, right? The, ins- the extra insurance was like twenty five dollars a day. It was going to come up to a little over a hundred bucks. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think I, even if I have to pay the two fifty, rolling the dice, yeah, I would have been all right. Which it doesn't look like I'll have to do because apparently they're supposed to collect that when they give you the second car. Mm-hmm. And I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, even though I was honest when I turned my car in, I told them I was like, "I'm sure you know, but this isn't the same car I had." And the lady was like, "Oh, I didn't know." <laughs> <laughs> That's so, strange enough in in and of itself. Yeah. Well, when, um. We didn't get a podcast out. No. Uh, we got there four hours later than we expected. Yeah. Um, and by then, we just wanted dinner and a drink because we hadn't eaten all day either. Because this happened like around the time that we were discussing where sh- we should stop for lunch. Yeah. And uh, we, we didn't make it to lunch. No. <laughs> we ate candy, I think. That that <laughs> at, was lunch. That was terrible. The, at the gas station that we got stranded at. Yeah. And I can only imagine what that lady in the gas station thought when we pull when the cop car pulls in and we unload all of our luggage out of this yeah. cop car and then start camping out <laughs> on the sidewalk. Yeah. It was like a first blood thing where really. she don't she was like, We don't like your kind here. Let me let me give you a ride to the other side of town. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kinda what it looked like, I think. Um, but she was super nice. Well, both the police officer and the, the, the lady in the yeah. uh, gas station were both super nice. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, th- thanks. Unlike the Enterprise people. Unlike, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, beyond that, the other reason that we didn't podcast while we were there is that we were just too drunk. Um, I don't mean like we couldn't have held a good conversation. I mean like we couldn't figure out how to put the equipment together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, meanwhile, um, Liberty Larry's daughter is like sitting in the corner, uh, making notes for blackmail in the future. 
and uh, in all likelihood, <laughs> it was, uh, but it was a fun weekend. Uh, yeah. Definitely, like I had a good time. It was nice to see everybody, um, the the family types, and my old friend uh, Jason. He came over for a night and hung out and had a drink and ate and talked. It was, was a good time. And, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We didn't talk about politics really, except in the context of movies, I suppose. Yeah. Um, As I remember that night, it was a lot of movie talk. <laughs> there was a lot of movie talk. Um, and, it, you know, it's probably a good thing, although I did really want to uh, to talk to him about the who will build, build the roads issue after um, our experience with every single bridge transition in Tennessee. Like, how's the government doing, you think? <laughs> like, uh, I'm going to go with not good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most of the roads were good, but every single bridge transition on or off a bridge was terrible terrible yeah it was ridiculous um but at least they were consistent we knew where to like really hang on <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah. another bridge guys grab the grab the bars <laughs> yeah um but it yeah it was a it was a really good weekend and uh we we should have probably podcasted but we didn't we're i'd like to say we were busy but that's not really true <laughs> we just we're busy having fun yeah 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 had some catching up to do absolutely um and so we'll make the same promise around Christmas time and we'll see if the same thing happens. See how that one goes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what do you want to talk about now? Uh, uh, well, I don't know which direction you want to go. Um, we may as well start with the Griner thing. Well, that's the big news of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so just, I guess, sometime today, I'm not sure exactly when, um, the U.S. made a prisoner swap with Russia to get Brittany Griner back, who's as people I'm sure know, is the NBA, WNBA yes. star. that was, Big difference. Yeah, yeah, big difference there. Yeah, that was um, arrested and charged with drug smuggling, I think was the official charge. She had like a, a marijuana vape or something. Yeah. And um, supposedly, I think that's even somewhat in question, um, but was arrested for that and was just sentenced a month ago, maybe? couple of weeks i'm not exactly sure but was has been in a penal colony in russia for pretty good stint now a couple of weeks at least maybe a month yeah and um so we swapped her for what was the other guy's name victor boot ah victor boot so yeah and he's the the arms dealer is what my understanding that's what i've been told as well um so yeah we made that prisoner swap today Mm -hmm. and i don't know like me personally, like I've I've heard a lot of people talking about it because so, it's like fresh in the news today, and a lot of people are upset about it. And while I'm not thrilled that I, I wish they could have got the, oh, what did I say the other guy's name? He was, was a marine, the um, marine Wheeland or something. Yeah, Paul Wheeland. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, that I wish they could have got both, and you know, brought both of them home. And honestly, I think um, if you're gonna prioritize one over the other. I think the Marine's been there four years. Mm -hmm. So I think he should have been the priority to get, get back. Um, but I don't hate this deal because, uh, my understanding is, is that they were, that it wasn't an option. Like the Russians had made the decision. It was going to be grinder for, um, for the, for boot, for the arms guy. And like, that was the deal. Like they weren't, Mm -hmm. they weren't willing to negotiate the other guy in this exchange. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think you have to take the deal. Like, at least somebody got to come home. Yeah. Um, it's better than nobody coming home. And and I don't have a pro like, because I know a lot of the people I've talked to, the big complaint is, is that, well, well Grinder hates this country and has said tons of disgusting things. And mm-hmm. while I have a problem with that. She might have changed her tune. In, I bet uh, she has Russia. changed her tune. But, <laughs> and, and I don't like Griner. Like, I mean, I don't like anybody that, b- that says stuff like that and believes that. Like, I don't mm. think this is a racist country. Like, I don't like all of that ki- type of stuff I have a problem with. Mm. But I also don't think that she deserves to sit in a jail in Russia, you know. Over something that's legal most places here. Exactly. Even though there's a bunch of people in jail for the exact same thing here, too. Exactly. So, I mean, Biden could really do some good and let those people out too here. Yeah. And he could do that. Like, yes. he, he absolutely could do that. Mm-hmm. So, this is something where the president definitely has the power. He has that authority to do that. 
um, and has chose not to. So, like I say, I mean, I'm happy for Griner, even though, like I say, not a big fan. But but I do think this was the right move. Yeah. And as far as the Victor Boot, I, I mean, like, I don't know how extensive his arms dealing is, but the United States government is the biggest arms dealer in the world. So I'm you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm not like, oh, man, this terrible guy yeah. should stay in jail here forever because he sold people guns or. Yeah. I mean, it's probably, I'm, I'm sure that it's, you know, I think worse than that, but yeah, but like I said, the U S government is the biggest arms dealer in the world. Yeah. So I, I don't really have a, a problem with that either. This yeah. guy going back out there. Yeah. You know, he might've been working for the U S government somewhere along the way. <laughs> the odds are he was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about it. It's just, I, I do think that I just, I think it's the right move. Like mm-hmm. I say, not a fan of Grinder, but I do think that, you know, I mean, she doesn't deserve to sit in, in a cell over a victimless crime. Yeah. Well, I, I'm pretty well, I mean, you know, the devil's in the details, but, uh, I'm pretty well on board with any prisoner exchange anywhere, anytime. Yeah. I just, you know, better to be at home, you know, and, and Especially with things that, like, in a lot of places in this country, what she was imprisoned for is nothing, is not a crime at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I, just, I don't have an issue with it. I'm, I'm glad that they made some kind of deal. And the other thing is that it just, uh, it just creates a little bit of a goodwill. It's good to have the U.S. and Russia talking, even if they're, if it's very limited. Yeah. Um, because there's no way this conflict is ever going to end without Russia and the U S talking anyway. Yeah. So I just assume go ahead and like, here's a starting point. The coverage I heard today too, did say that this kind of worked like something out of a movie. I forget which country they met in to do the prisoner swap, but it was exactly what you would picture out of a movie where like the two planes land Mm -hmm. and then one prisoner walks out and the other walks out and they kind of pass each other as they get in the opposite plane to come back. I wonder if it was that Angelina Jolie movie, uh, salt or salt. That seems right. Anyway, that that's kind of, when you said that, that was what I thought of that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a there's certainly a lot going on over there, and um, Ukraine has launched some attacks into Russia, like deep into Russian territory, um, with uh, some Soviet era drones, I guess that they retrofitted to be, you know, to drop bomb not bombs exactly. I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't quite understand the mechanics of it, honestly. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Uh, we're able to set off explosives at a couple of Russian air bases, um, killing three Russians. And although the Russians say that the damage was mostly from debris that they were able to intercept the, the drones before they actually hit their target. Yeah. So where did this happen again? My bad. Um, it, like in a couple of places, well inside Russia, a couple okay. hundred miles inside the border. So an attack on the homeland. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not talking about Crimea or the just reclaimed republics. But I'm the legit about like, homeland. Yeah, like a hundred miles south of Moscow. Wow. Okay. Um, but Moscow isn't that far in into it, the yeah into Russia from Ukraine anyway. Yeah. Point being that they did launch an attack against um, Russian forces well within the the Russian territory. Um, I can't imagine that this didn't happen without U.S. approval. And in fact, uh, our old friend Victoria Newland, famous for her F the EU comments, uh, was in Ukraine the day that this happened, like in Kiev. Yeah. Um. And uh, the the other, I, I think, really the important point is back to the atomic thing because um, both of these air bases housed planes that were from the strategic bomber squadrons in Russia, which means um, the bomber squadrons that carry nuclear weapons, which also means that there were likely nuclear weapons on these bases. Yeah. Which, like, you're literally playing with fire. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just like shelling the... Um, the nuclear plant, you're like literally playing with fire. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a big escalation. What, it really, too, and, the, my question would be what good would really ever come from that? Either of those, the shelling the nuclear plant or Ukraine attacking a base that they know houses these weapons. Like what, 
What do we? What would either side really gain from that? What would Ukraine gain from that? Ukraine could gain from it because there have been like incremental escalations um, by Russia in response to things that Ukraine has done. Yeah. Um, so um, the Ukraine Western powers, however you want to look at it, have have been the uh, have initiated escalations throughout this war, yeah. and the Russians have responded in kind. So. Um, they had the the bridge explosion into Crimea, yeah. Um, and uh, the response from the Russians was that's when they started attacking the energy infrastructure of Ukraine, okay. Um, and and so forth. I, I think that Ukraine, just based on the way they've been throughout this, um, Ukraine's goal is to uh, trigger a response from Russia that will bring NATO into the war. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that's absolutely seems like that's their goal, so... Yeah. Only way they can win. Yeah. And even then, there's questions about whether anybody wins. Yeah. If NATO gets involved. But there's no way that Ukraine can win a war against Russia, even in Ukraine. Yeah. Even, given, just, even just repelling them? Yeah, given time, yeah. Russia will roll them over eventually. Yeah. It just, it's inevitable. Yeah. Um, Russia has a lot more people, uh, even with the the um, U.S. and NATO giving all this equipment to Ukraine, um, Russia has more advanced equipment to draw on. Mm. So it, it just, it, it's, on a long enough timeline, Russia wins this. Yeah. As, given, you know, the status quo. Even with the U.S. and NATO giving weapons to Ukraine. I just yeah. don't think that they can hold out forever because they just don't have the manpower or the material. Yeah. And they're corrupt enough that even given enough materials, it doesn't all get to the right place. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's the only way that can happen. Of course, the I guess something that a lot of people have pointed out that th is that throughout the Cold War, through all those proxy wars all over the planet between the U.S. and Russia, or the Soviet Union Soviet. at the time, yeah, um, that there, like it was always like taboo to encourage any of these client states to attack the homeland of the other country. Yeah, doesn't seem to be a problem anymore. All of a sudden, well. I, I would say though this this one is actually on the border of I mean were any of those other proxy wars on the border of the other country? Um, some of them were pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there's Korea. This is not actually. Is does Korea share a border? I'm not. I'm sure. trying to picture <laughs> this map in my head, and I'm not doing a very yeah. good job um, <laughs> because it's in the you know the north. Uh, the northern part of Asia, but Russia spreads all the way across northern Asia. Yeah. So anyway, they're, they've definitely been they've close. They've been close at the least. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there was the, the Slavic Republic. Well, that was, uh, I guess that was after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that there's been any actually on Russia's border. There have certainly been operations on Russia's border. Yeah. Or uh, on the border of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I guess considering the Soviet Union and all the stands being a part of that nation and so forth at the time, some of those conflicts had to have happened on the border. Yeah. So okay. I, I'm not 100% on that, rate, but I would say they so. weren't encouraged. There was no encouragement to attack. Yeah, it was the, taboo. Yeah. Uh, like you wouldn't want your client state to attack the Russian homeland or the Soviet homeland. Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I can't imagine this happened without uh, U.S. encouragement and uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, or approval. Yeah. And, and, you know, Victoria Newland was there with uh, Zelensky on the day that these attacks happened. So, yeah. I think it's fair to assume that she was there to tell him either to encourage him to do it or to tell him that it was okay if he did. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see what kind of Russian response we get. Yeah. Uh, it won't be good for Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course this, this whole thing could have been done a long time ago. Uh, if the U S hadn't been encouraging Ukraine to keep fighting and giving them all this material and money, 
and uh, you know they could be back to a more or less normal life without having lost much. Yeah, but that's not possible anymore. Yeah, well, I mean they've already lost so much. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean a lot yeah. of people dead. Yeah, and the, you know there's territory that I sincerely doubt they're getting back. Yeah. Um, that they didn't have to lose. They could have really just given up Crimea and the Donbass, and now there's more lost. So do you think the U.S. will ever recognize those as legitimate no. Russian territories? I mean, I didn't no. think they would. We haven't either. even ended a war with North Korea. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I think that it'll be a, an excuse for a conflict forever. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people, you know, we talk about it over and over again. There's a lot of people in the U.S. that benefit from major power war or yeah. major power conflict at the very least. Yeah. Um, I guess nobody like really benefits in the long term from war, like real war. Yeah. Uh, but certainly just the, you know, cold wars are great for business. Yeah. Um, for military just contractors. Building up. Yeah. 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 And um, so... And, of course, the, even these conflicts where the U.S. isn't directly involved are good for the military contractors because they go out there and sell weapons. Yeah. Like I said, the U.S. is the biggest arms dealer in the world. Yeah. So. And um, I, so I, I think that there's a lot of incentives for a lot of people to keep doing this. It's a big business. Yeah. And um, I, I don't think that's changing. Not anytime soon. No. Unless the people... I mean, like... The citizens of the U.S. really do have power to do something about that. Of course, the military contractors have done have set up their businesses very strategically, so that every little district is creating is building something. Yeah. Um. For yeah. the for the uh, military industrial complex, they're they're building something f for military contractors. So, no matter what, every single representative in this country has to go home and say, well. Um, I voted against this package that generates jobs in my district. Yeah. But that's not popular at home. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's another one of those things where people just don't understand that it's it it's not generating any wealth. Yeah. Like we're not becoming richer as a society because of this. It's money that's being taken from the private sector and, and put into military. Um, it could be better. Like there's. It's the broken window stuff. It's the the seen and the unseen. What you're not seeing is the thing, the productive things that that money could do, that could build wealth in this country to make us all better off. Hard to explain that that to the guy that's working mm -hmm. at North or Grummet, though. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm just saying, like that guy losing his job, he's gonna care. <laughs> yeah, and his um, whole family's gonna care, and all them people vote, at least some of them. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of those situations where the benefits are con concentrated into a group that very clearly sees the benefits and um, the damages are diffuse among the whole population. So everybody else only pays a little bit and can't necessarily connect it to this particular thing. But that's what's going on. Um, this is all lost wealth. Yeah. yeah. It, it is bleeding away the wealth of this country that we all share. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've heard the expression... Uh, uh, Rising tide raises all boats. Nope. Yeah, I mean, that's what's going on. But the the reverse is also true. Like, as you're bleeding away wealth, we all are worse off. Yeah. Um, there are a few people, select people, that may benefit greatly, but in the long term, they don't. Because as wealth disappears from this country, as, as wealth is siphoned off, um, then, um, then everybody is worse off in the long run. Like, you know, it... It's, it's even hard to keep collecting taxes at some point where your people are so poor that they can't pay taxes. Yeah. And I don't know why. It made me think of the Robin Hood story, right? So, like, a lot of people think of, of Robin Hood, you know, the they talk about... Um, Steal from the, the rich, give to the poor. Yeah, exactly. But what he was actually doing is he was, he was stealing from the tax collectors. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the actual story. Is that the yeah. the um, that's who the rich was? Yeah, the rich was yeah. the was the government. Yeah, that was stealing money from people to support their own little foibles or whatever, yeah. um, their own whims. Um, and they were overtaxing the people. And he wasn't stealing anything. Actually, he was taking stolen money and bringing it back to the people that it belonged to. Returning, at it, least yeah. from our perspective. Yeah, um, which is the correct perspective, of course. Absolutely. So um, the Robin Hood wasn't stealing from a bunch of wealthy businessmen. He was stealing from the state who was stealing their money. Yeah. Uh, wealthy businessmen have to 
have to give you something to get your money. Government doesn't. Yeah. And um, and and this is as good a time as any, I guess, to switch over to the uh, um, to the unions thing because oh, yeah. it gives me the opportunity to start off complaining about public sector unions, <laughs> um, and then we can talk about the real issue. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but um, th- this is the problem that I've always had with public sector unions: is that a private sector union um, they they have to operate within the bounds of profit and loss. Like they can get more money from their employer. But if they get too much money from their employer, then their employer doesn't make any money and the whole business fails and nobody gets anything. Yeah. But that doesn't work that way with a public sector union because they're not generating any profit. They're not doing anything productive. Yeah. Um, they don't have to worry about profit and loss. All uh, their money is stolen. All their money is taken from the taxpayer. So um, if they uh, if they negotiate better and better deals for themselves, it just costs everybody else. Um, and everybody else has no choice. They can't say, well, your product is too expensive for me now. I'm going to go somewhere else. No, that's not what happens. The government either steals or prints or borrows, and those are all different versions of stealing as far as I'm concerned, yeah. um, the money that they need to pay the public sector union, whatever it is that they demand. Yeah. And um, so it, it's uh, what they're doing is they're advocating to uh, to steal more of the public's money rather than advocating to get more for themselves and potentially putting their business at risk. Yeah. Like there's a balancing act to be to be played by a private sector union because they can drive their wages up so high or their benefits up so high that they destroy their uh, their income potential altogether. The business altogether, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's not true of public sector unions. Yeah. Well, I've always had it. I have a problem with unions in general. Now, I don't have a problem with them per se existing. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, if, if a group of people want to get together and join the union, I think that's fine. Um, my problem comes in is if I want to work for this company and then I'm forced to join this union with them yes. because the way I view unions is that, so I'm basically putting out, giving up my right to negotiate with my employer and I'm giving it to this union. And I don't like that. Like I, I can represent myself. Like I can, I can represent myself to my employer just fine. I don't need a union to do that for me. Um, and what I've seen in the past is what unions really do is protect the people who don't want to work, mm-hmm. the lazy people. Like yeah. that's really what a union does is take care of the lazy. I think that that's mostly true now. Uh, there was a time where unions were really important for protecting the workers. Okay. Um, I mean, there was a time where working conditions were uh, were so bad that people needed to band together. And I'm yeah. all for that. And I'm all for that now. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, if, a, if a company is mistreating its employees and all the employees get together and it's like, look, we, this is the only way we're going to do something about this is if mm-hmm. we band together, more power to you. Yeah. Like, I'm good with that. But I'm, I, I, where I have the issue is, is when it's like, okay, we're all going to band together and we're going to do this. And if you, you all don't do it, then you're, there's consequences. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, there's the potential railroad strike now that's going yeah. on, and, I, and I, I, as I understand it, the um, the real issue is that they don't have they don't get sick days. But it was a, an agreement. Now I don't know the the details of like how long these contracts are supposed to last, or because Did, didn't we just get through this? It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but um, like I said, the the sticking point now is the sick leave issue. Um, where the unions years ago n- negotiated a contract with the the railways, I guess the okay. employers anyway. Yeah. Um, where they gave up sick leave for higher regular pay. Yeah. And now they want the sick leave too. <laughs> <laughs> On top of the higher regular pay. Right. Um, and they're <laughs> at an at an impasse, and I guess the uh, uh, the Biden administration is stepping in and saying that that they have to agree to the previous. Um, to, to the results of the previous negotiation because it's which, a good deal. Well, there's yeah. I, I will. I swear, I heard him say that somewhere. He probably did. <laughs> um, which is uh, there's like a million problems with this to talk to talk about, but we'll only pick out a few. All right. Um, the first one is that, like, okay, this is a problem that was created by government legislation in the first place, because in a in a in a free market. Um, what would happen is that the 
that each of these, it, like even if you had the union, yeah, all right, um, the union and the employer come together and they either make an agreement or they don't. Yeah. And if they don't come to an agreement, then the employer can is free to hire somebody else that can work at the with the conditions that they wish. Agree to. Yeah, that they agree to. And the union members can go work somewhere else that has uh, uh, conditions that they agree with. Like yeah. you're free to go work somewhere else and we're free to hire somebody else. But that's not how unions work in this country because there's been a bunch of legislation that essentially traps both of these entities yeah. into this negotiation where they have to come to an agreement because neither can go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, and that's kind of where my problem stops in. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at is like, there's when you get in a situation where you get the government involved in this, mm -hmm. that's where the problems come in. Like, a, like the whole, like we're going to band together and, and, try to force this employer to do something. Hey, all for that. But like I know in a lot of states, like you can't go work at a unionized job without joining the union. Mm -hmm. like, well, that's a separate issue entirely, but what you've, uh, you've abolished with this first part and we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, what you've abolished with this first part is essentially is private contracts. Yeah. Like that um, employers are no longer free to negotiate their own contracts. And I guess that's a part of what you're talking about, too. But yeah. even the union isn't really free to negotiate its own contract. Yeah. And the employer isn't either. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're both stuck in this. Yeah. Like, you're going to get along. You, you two are together and you have to get along. Right. Um, and if you don't, then the government will step in and impose a contract on both parties. Yeah. Um, which, you know, which in a free country should never happen. Well, yes, <laughs> just say um, it. Like. Absolutely true. And, and of course this tramples all over freedom of association, which I would say is a basic human right that you can, um, either, uh, you're free to compete or negotiate or cooperate or not ignore yeah. anybody you choose. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, you know, this isn't possible in this um, relationship. That, yeah. Like you said, because of the legislation that, that prevents them from going elsewhere, they're essentially forced to come to some sort of an agreement or the government will agree on something for them. Yeah. Both sides. Everybody loses. Yeah. Um, so that's where we are with this. And, you know, I mean, I don't have a problem with, uh, with workers... Um, banding together um, to try and get better conditions, better pay, and so forth. Uh, they are limited by the profit and loss system in the private industry. Um, if the employer, th so, but here's the flip side of it. If the employer isn't willing to agree with the union um, and the union walks, like that's a problem, yeah. um, but the employer should be able to hire other people that are willing to work for what they're offering, Yeah, which they can't really At do. even lower wages. Or yeah. maybe, I mean, or, but that's not odd, odds are that's not going to be the scenario. They're going to have to hire them in at higher wages, but yeah, that's, to get people that's in the there. market mm -hmm. working. Like yeah. that's how that, that hashes out. Well, I mean, you say they may have to, they are probably going to end up having to hire them in at higher wages, but um, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I suspect that there's a whole lot of people that were waiting for any kind of job. Oh. That would be happy to fill those positions at a lower wage. All I'm going to tell you is you ain't had to hire nobody lately. <laughs> well, uh, true. I mean, but it's well. tough out there, man. Like, and I'm not. I'm in my industry, and it's mm -hmm. it's my it's its own thing. Mm -hmm. But the the labor market is a mess right now, and it has yeah. been for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, since well, I say for a while, but since COVID, yeah. Um, the labor market has gotten messed up, and so. You know, I mean, maybe odds are you're going to have to hire those guys, the, the scabs in at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I don't, I would be surprised. Maybe not a higher, necessarily the rate that the union is requesting, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to hire them in, in at least the rate that, of what you're paying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, I don't know. I don't know either. Like I say, <laughs> I'm talking as far as the particularly the road rail industry. I don't. I can't mm -hmm. speak to. Yeah. But I I can speak to like the labor market's tough. Yeah. Um. Well, those are pretty high paying jobs to begin with. Yeah. Um. I I think the average salary of a Union Pacific employee is something like ninety four thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Which, Which ain't as much as it used to be. No, but it sounds pretty good to me. I would take ninety four thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Well, where we live, like yeah. <laughs> that that may not like depending on where you live in this country, mm. that's 
probably just getting by, I would imagine. Yeah, but that's an average wage. Yeah, so so the, like people, the odds are the places that are that the cost of living is higher, those mm-hmm. wages probably go up in those areas. Yeah. And man, you work on a railroad, you can live anywhere. You got to ride wherever you want to <laughs> go. Ride, as long as there's a <laughs> rail, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's very little of this country that isn't covered by railroad. Well, there you go. Uh, so. Built this country on railroad. It's true. Mm-hmm. But not high speed rail. So? <laughs> it's very low speed rail. <laughs> not all of it. Well, I don't know. Some of it goes pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, man, they've improved engine technology all this time. It's not like it's a damn steam engine, like chug, chug, chugging away anymore. It's not quite the same thing. Well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I know, and I know you're right. We're not, we're not talking about the, you know, the Back to the Future three kind of thing. <laughs> but that's what I picture in my head every time the rail comes up. Like that's the old west is what I'm picturing, yeah. man. This old steam engine just chugging along. Well, it, it has modernized a bit in the last 150 years. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, like you, you have gotten rid of this freedom of association, uh, both by forcing people to enter um, unions that they don't want to, uh, which of course also forces them to pay dues to unions, yeah. um, and uh, and abide by whatever negotiations the union makes. Yeah. So uh, taking away your ability to negotiate for yourself. Um, I, I agree with you. Like while there was a, a time and, and it still could be in some cases now, but I think that it's far less common. Um, there was a time where unions were had a place instrumental in making sure that employee employees were in a safe working environment. Yeah. Um, or were covered for their unsafe working environments or what have you. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that that's generally the case now. It's generally about more money, more benefits. And it, it's also about, um, protecting the weakest employees at the expense of the best employees. Yeah. Um, that's the, absolutely been my experience. Like, <laughs> I mean, that, that's what I've seen at least. And like I said, I haven't ever worked for a union, but I've worked with companies that have unions and that's what I've seen. Yeah. Um, and think of what that does to the average skill of your employee too. Yeah, it brings the whole group down. Like yeah. because because honestly, and it really does, because what ends up happening is those people who want to be lazy and are mm-hmm. out there trying to be actively be as lazy as possible, yeah, hold a grudge against the people they see going hard. Mm-hmm. And it creates a culture of <laughs> I'm sure the grudge goes the other way too. Oh, it does, but yeah. but the thing is is there's nothing you can do in in a normal environment, the lazy people would weed their self out over time through mm-hmm. management and through just consequences. Mm -hmm. But the union protects those people. Yeah. Well, I think that the other thing that happens probably is that the people that do that go hard um, are find that they're not rewarded for the the effort that they put in and try and find an industry where they will be. Yeah. Yeah. Or quit going hard because they're. Yeah. I mean, or they become lazy, too. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So it creates a a lazy culture. Hmm. So. Um. So, uh, yeah, Biden's going to step in. He's the big deal maker this time and is going to tell everybody what they have to do. So he's the big guy. He's the big guy. All right. He's the big guy. He, he's, he's got the art of the deal now. Oh, okay. He's, except, of course, he's got the power of the federal government to enforce his deal, no matter <laughs> how good a deal it is. I think is. anybody who has the full power <laughs> of the federal government has the deal-making ability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then... So. Uh, like one last topic that I thought that we would hit that we talked about on the way back from Tennessee that um, I found to be an interesting discussion. And this is kind of inside baseball stuff, um, but just uh, talking about the future of the LP. Oh, yeah, we did talk about that. And, um, and you know, what we're looking forward to in terms of uh, um, prospects for the LP political revolution in this country, um, what, what could happen over the next, you know, two, six, ten years. Yeah, ten year plan. The, yeah, the ten year plan. Yeah. Uh, so it it seems unless somebody else really steps up, chances are that the LP nominee for president in twenty twenty four um, is going to be either Spike Cohen or Dave Smith. Both solid choices. Mm-hmm. I've came to the conclusion. Um, Spike had to win me over, but I feel like he's done it. Yeah, I I really like Spike now. Mm-hmm. I I think I think that Spike would be the better choice. I um I I think that uh that's 
Spike is um, is more articulate in the ideas, and he's not uh, dumbing them down. Yeah. Um, he is probably more palatable to most people than and the LP, which is which is yeah. really where I the reason that I would pick Spike personally over mm -hmm. Dave Smith, and I am a huge fan of Dave Smith. Yeah, well, me too. I think, and I think Dave Smith to me. He's the fun candidate. Like he's he's a comedian by trade, and he's just an interesting guy. But I I think that the party as a whole is just going to have a hard time swallowing Dave Smith, and and I think the party as a whole can really unite at with Spike Cohen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that and for those reasons, I think he's the better candidate. Yeah, um, I think he's probably better in the public eye generally too. Yeah, um, he's got a little less baggage. That he's carrying around than Dave does. Yeah. Um, some, you know, history issues that will come up in a in a presidential election that probably I I would guess that Spike has less yeah. to confront than Dave does. Although I don't think like what they would come up uh against Dave with is something that he would be at all concerned about or no. Uh, or I mean, ashamed of or whatever, but I feel like he's absolutely a lean into the skid guy. Yeah, and and with with his background as a comedian, I think he could have a good time with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and there's something to be said for humor and spreading your message. Spike's funny too. He I, is. I, I get oh, a he absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think that um, this is one of those cases where it's not like it's not like the difference between a uh. Uh, John McAfee and Gary Johnson. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. it's not like you have the, the radical libertarian and the guy that is going to be more palatable to bear everybody else, but he's just kind of this milk toast in the middle, um, you know, fiscally conservative, socially liberal, whatever yeah. uh, guy. That's not, that's not who's barely a libertarian. Yeah. Um, yeah. By a lot of definitions. Yeah. Um, this is, is two guys that are both like pretty hardcore. Yeah. I um, absolutely agree. And, um, at, like they, they both have opinions that I disagree with. I know that spike leans a little bit more into that left libertarian realm. Yeah. Um, but not in ways that upset me in, in any particular way. He's yeah. really good on the most important issues. And there are some of those things like the immigration thing where I think that you would probably disagree with spike and I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, there's, uh, I think that both of them can represent the party very well and the idea, ideology of libertarianism, um, really well. Yeah. And I think they're both quick enough on their feet that they can handle, um, antagonism, yeah. uh, which Gary Johnson was not capable of doing. Yeah. And John McAfee, you probably didn't want him <laughs> doing it. All right. Um, may he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. <laughs> if he's really dead. <laughs> well, wow, that's. I'm sure there's been McAfee sightings, like Elvis sightings, but uh, I'm sure. Uh, at any rate, I, they're they're both good, solid candidates, and they're both very capable of of representing the ideology of libertarianism and defending it. Um, and they're both they both keep up very well. So I, I can't imagine an Aleppo moment with either one of them. No. Um, if nothing else, they both have enough sense to, if they get a question about something that they're not sure about, being able to redirect it in a way that they can kind of figure out what it is before they answer. Absolutely. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I like, I can't imagine <laughs> either one of them saying that. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think that the way the major parties are going now, like people are really starting to become disillusioned. And my uncle, so I, I, uh, man, I, uh, stayed up late one night, um, with my uncle around Thanksgiving, um, debating some stuff. And we have some like pretty severe disagreements. And one of those things is that he is one of those people that truly believes that voting for a third party is a waste of a vote because they have no chance of winning. Um, you're just taking a vote away from somebody who could potentially win. Now, my response to that is the same as it has always been, which is, well, they definitely have no chance of winning if I don't vote for them. Yep. All right. And I think that voting for a person that I don't believe in is a waste of a vote anyway. Uh, it's not a, this is not a horse race. You're yeah, not I'm, trying to pick the winner. You're just, you're, you're voting your conscience. I hope you're voting your ideology. You're voting for the guy that you think will take things in the direction that you would like to see them go. Um, it doesn't matter whether they'll win or not. And the other, the, like the final thing on that is by that logic, any vote for anyone, a, a vote for anyone other than the winner 
is a wasted vote. Yeah. Because the truth is, like, it really does come down to the only people whose votes count are the people who voted for the winner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make sense to me to say, well, somebody doesn't have a chance of winning and therefore there's no sense in voting for them. You may as well vote for somebody you don't like who may have a chance of winning. No, completely disagree. And, and it's that kind of thinking that like, that's the kind of propaganda that the two major parties have put in everybody's head. Yeah. Um, it goes back to that Simpsons, uh, uh, Halloween episode with, uh, Dole and Clinton, yeah. um, where they're taken over by Kane and Kodos, the two aliens. Yeah. Right. And they, they're exposed before the election. Um, and people are like, oh, well, you know, uh, I'll, I guess I'll, you know, we can't vote for these guys. And they say, well, you, you have no choice. You have to vote for one of us. It's a two party system. Yeah. And some guy out in the audience says, well, I think I'll vote for a third party this year. And they say, go ahead, throw, throw your, your vote, vote away. away. Yes. And then of course, one of them is elected. Yeah, exactly. Even because though, you know, they're both evil aliens bent on enslaving the whole planet. Yeah. Exactly. It seems like very realistic now. Like it does. You know, like, like this is this is this was not a satire. Yeah. Uh, so and you look at the candidates over the like, you know Trump and Clinton. Yeah. Trump and Biden. Uh, you know you the, almost they don't even pick worse people. Yeah, like, exactly. And and that's part of the game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I think they intentionally pick terrible people because fear is a much ba- better motivator of getting people to vote. Yeah. Like, yeah. you have to vote for our guy because if you vote for the other guy, like, if you don't vote for our guy, then the other guy might win. Yeah. And you don't want that. He'll end democracy or whatever. <laughs> right. Um, whatever the trope is or today. He'll, he'll end the nation because one. he's going to d- delete the borders and yeah. um, there will be no difference between men and women or whatever. Do you, you, know, do whatever you really kind of want that stuff. guy's finger on the button? Yeah, Remember yeah. that one? Oh, gosh. That comes up every time, too. Yeah. Um, so I don't want anybody's but, finger on the button. <laughs> like, hey, there you go. Why don't we do away with the button? How yeah, about that? <laughs> let's get rid of the button. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is exciting to know that we're going to have that. Hopefully, I mean, it's way early, way too mm-hmm. early, but that one of them two will be the standard bearer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes you kind of question or think about like, okay, so, so what's the, what's the future look like for the LP? So mm-hmm. if we have a really good campaign with either of those two candidates, like, what does that mean for the next cycle? Because obviously we're not going to win this next cycle, mm-hmm. the one we're going into. 2024. We're yeah. not winning 2024. Like, that's that's just not happening. But a strong campaign um, where with people— With good messaging. With good messaging, um, something like the 2012 and 2008 Ron Paul campaigns, where you mm-hmm. really get that kind of groundswell under under this movement— um, what would that, what could that mean for the cycle after? Yeah. Well, in the 2008 and the 2012 campaigns, people weren't so completely dissatisfied with the major parties then. Well, like, it wasn't not to the same so degree. blatantly. Like, yeah. yeah, like the, the powers that be have gotten extremely lazy with hiding mm-hmm. their, you know. Nefariousness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. There's a, there's a lot more disdain out there for both parties mm-hmm. than there was back then. Um, yeah. Well, and I can see people going out there and like, okay, so they're not going to vote for the Libertarian Party this time. But they were hearing some things, like they heard some stuff during the election that started making them like really think about it. Yeah. And then one of these terrible candidates, whatever terrible candidates were offered yeah. um, for the re- Republicans and the Democrats, um, gets elected into office and the country continues to go badly like it has been for ever. <laughs> for a century. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and people are start to think, you know, like, okay, like I thought that they couldn't win and maybe they can't, but there's no way I can keep voting for one of these two, two well, major parties that are so terrible. These guys are so terrible. And you see in, in 2028 that the Libertarian Party gets like between 10 and 15% of the vote nationally. Yeah, yeah. Now, now it seems like a real party. Exactly. Well, and it, it, it does what I hope happens is that so once you hit kind of that's kind of a tipping point where you end up in a situation where the media and the other two parties start recognizing that the LP may be a legitimate threat 
And all they have to do is start fear mong because what will happen is is they'll mm-hmm. go to the only thing they know is fear mongering the LP. It's like, yeah. well, you can't elect these guys because they'll destroy they'll, our democracy. They'll destroy our country. They'll tear down our government. They'll, uh, you know, all of the stuff will come out. They'll make us less safe because they'll pull our troops out of everywhere. Yeah, start mm-hmm. start doing this fear mongering. And at that point, we're in. Yeah. Because, and and because, then you got a bunch of people out there that are also going, wait, they'll get our troops out of places? Yeah. Well, that's Sweet. just it. They'll st- <laughs> that's where they start doing our job for us. Because mm-hmm. just like you're saying, that a lot of these ideas aren't as unpopular as the mainstream media would think. Yeah. And so... And then it also, it does away with the big thing, because anytime you talk to people who are sympathetic to the LP, they you always get the same response as your uncle, mm-hmm. that, well, they can't win anyway, I'm not wasting my vote. And once they acknowledge that we're a threat, mm-hmm. that goes away. Yeah. And that will be, that could potentially be a groundswell. Yeah. And, the, and I just don't believe that the media and the powers that be would understand what they unleash when they give that up. Yeah. And for those of you that are still hanging on to the old parties for whatever reason, uh, this is what I have to say to to each side. Um, If you are a Republican who believes in small government, then your party doesn't represent you anymore. Yep. There is no small government party. The only small government party is the Libertarian Party. If you really believe in small government, low taxes, and the government staying out of your business, then... Republican Party isn't your answer. The Libertarian Party is. And for those of you on the left that believe in civil liberties and individual rights and that people should be able to make their own choices about their lives, the Democrat Party doesn't represent you. Yep. Um, because they they believe that they should be able to control every aspect of your life, tell you what to think, what words you can use, et cetera, et cetera. Not that the Republicans don't do that too, but in a different way. But I mean, but that is that is the agenda of the Democrat Party at this point. Yeah. Um, is to uh, to essentially abolish individual rights, to make everything collective. Yeah. Um, the to they abolish the individual to entirely. Um, to control your speech, to control the way you think, the to control your options. It's um, the party of control. And uh, so, if you believe in in civil liberties and in individual rights, um, then your answer is not with the uh, the Democrats. It's with the Libertarian Party. Yeah. Absolutely. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, I'm like libertarians 2032. Yeah. That, that's what I, I do think a, a good, strong campaign in this next cycle could, could be that kind of bellwether, like could, mm-hmm. could head us that direction, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and political revolutions happen really fast. Yeah. Um, the Republican party only existed for two election cycles before, uh, before they took over. Yeah. Yeah. And have been there for 150 years now. Yeah. So if, all, all it takes is for everybody to, it, all it takes, it doesn't even take the media seeding the ground that I was talking about earlier. It really just takes people believing that their vote, you know, is not wasted on the third party. If enough people start believing that, mm-hmm. then, then the game's over. Yeah. What I want you to believe is that, that voting for a candidate that you don't believe in is a wasted vote. Yeah. Let us earn your vote. Like yeah. I'm I'm all for that. Like mm-hmm. I mean, I think our ideas are the best. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> Wouldn't be um, doing this otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> so All um, right. Um you got anything more? No. Nah, go ahead and wrap it up. I think that's it, man. Good, because it's getting really warm in this room. It is. <laughs> um so okay. Uh well, let's see. Today's the eighth, right? So we're just middle of the of December. We're we're not getting into Christmas time just yet next week. So we we plan to be back uh, next week. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, um, tell your friends, uh, all that other stuff. Uh, you can leave reviews here and there. Um, you can make comments on Facebook and um, Podbean. Right. And YouTube. So there's a bunch of places you can comment yeah. and you can always email me at Michael at the Liberty And, uh, we will be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.